Testing. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Um, I am pretty excited to share something with you this morning. Um, I know that most of you probably didn't even know that I could play instruments at all, and um, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I have actually been learning from the amazing Stella Crouch on how to play piano, and I'm. Um, I absolutely love to write, so she helped me finish this one up, and it was during a time when I was feeling so lost and so worthless, like I meant nothing to anyone. And we all get to that point. We all have those moments where we feel so unworthy, and um, God finds a way to lift us up if we allow him to. So this is how he lifted me. He um, put a song in my heart and he said, sing it. So I'm here not to, not to sing a song and get praise, but I'm here to share a message with you. Because I, I know that, <laughs> I tried to get out of this, I'm gonna tell you that right now. So I know that God had a reason for um, wanting me to do this today. So I know there's somebody who needs to hear this. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna go ahead and sing for you. Um, the song is called Priceless. And forgive me, I'm a little nervous, so this might just take me a minute.
please remain seated while we sing the invocation song near to the heart of God. Then please kneel for prayer. for your throne of grace this morning, Lord, to thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day that we're here this morning to worship you and praise your holy name. We want to thank you, Father, that we can put the world aside this morning and just think of you, Father, when you went to the cross to die for each and every one of us. And I pray the Lord, this morning for all to my church family and also to our visitors that came from different churches visiting us so they can worship here together. We want to thank you again, Father, for the week that went by also and you have to take each and every one of us. And now we're here because we love you and we want to worship you again. Thank you, Father, for everything. Thank you that when you went to the cross, Father, and died for each and every one of us, you forgive us for all the sin that we have committed against you. And we want to thank you for that, Father. And I pray now again this morning, Lord, for Pastor Eric as he delivered the bread of life to us this morning, Father. Continue to bless him, continue to give him the strength so he can do your ministry. And soon and very soon, Father, you will come in the cloud of heaven and you will take each and every one home. And we're looking forward for that day in the Lord when you come. Because this world now is so much destruction, temptation, Father. And I pray that you will help us. And again, this morning, Father, I pray for each and every one of us and help us to keep this day holy because it's your holy day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. May God bless the reading of his word.
Happy Sabbath, church. Can you hear me okay? I'm looking at you, and everybody looks like this. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and turn to somebody, give them a nice big smile, and make sure you show them your front teeth. Why don't you do that? Amen. It helps me to preach when I see you smiling. <laughs> Laughter is like medicine, right? Smiles are good. Good for the soul. This morning we're going to continue in our series that we had previous start, previously started called In God We Trust, Bringing Your Financial Life Into Line with Biblical principles. In this series, we're covering uh, stewardship and what that is. And the last time we were together was back in January. Can't believe how time is passing. But back in January, we talked about stewardship. It's really not about money. I hope we all learned that. But today, we're going to focus on uh, topic number two in our series, Tithes and Offerings, returning God's holy portion. And then this afternoon at 1.30, this afternoon at what time? 1.30. 1.30, we're actually going to have another sermon. It's going to be more of a discussion session. But this afternoon at 1.30, we want to take what we learned this morning, and then we want to see the other side of it, which is this morning we're looking at the giving side, but this afternoon we're going to look at what the church actually does with the tithes and offerings. The presentation is called Church Finance, Funding the Gospel Ministry. So plan on staying after potluck. This is going to be a very interesting presentation. We're going to go through a lot of interesting things. And then it doesn't stop there because on Tuesday, what day? Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, we're going to continue with session four. And our, we're going to have uh, Sabbath uh, sessions and weekday sessions. The weekday sessions allow us to cover things that we can't uh, you know, uh, cover directly on Sabbath. But this coming Tuesday night, we're going to talk about the financial life cycle, planning for the seasons of life. Now all of us go through a life cycle. We start young and then we grow older, we get married, we have kids, we work, we, they have kids, we have uh, you know, grandkids, we retire, we do this, we do that. What are the concerns? What are the financial things you should know and plan ahead for as you look at the seasons of life? These are things that I wish someone would have told me when I first started out. It's going to be very interactive. It's going to rely on the collective wisdom of everyone who comes who has been through all these phases. I myself don't know all of it, and so I'm going to join with you, and we're going to explore that together. So that's this Tuesday night. Uh, it's February 6th. At what time? 7 p.m. What time? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And then there's, well, I'm going to tell you more about the ones to come. But uh, eventually I'm going to have a little flyer sheet that I will get to you. I'm making these as we go, so uh, forgive me for not giving it to you in advance. I want to start off this morning by talking about the end time message. We know in Revelation chapter 14, it warns us that right before the second coming of Christ, there is going to be an end time call to the world to prepare for Christ's arrival. To the Adventist church, we know this very, very well as the three angels' messages. And the first angel's message says, saying with a loud voice, this angel, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of what? His judgment has come. Now, the final judgment is going on now. We understand that the judgment does begin before the second coming of Christ. And Luke chapter 16 tells us that in this final judgment, we are to give an account of our what? Our stewardship. So in other words, we need to understand our role as God's stewards. Stew what are our stewards? They're simply God's managers. 
Okay, so what is our role and why is this so important in the judgment? Well, we're going to be exploring that throughout the series, but our approach is we're taking the gospel principles as found in the Bible and we're bringing them to bear on our financial life. The, 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 this, is, this, this whole thing we're doing is part of a larger process of discipleship. And discipleship is that process whereby we learn to bring all the areas of our life under the Lordship of Christ. When I call Jesus Lord, He is just not Lord of my spiritual life. He's Lord of my love life. He's Lord of my financial life. He's Lord of my physical life. He's Lord of everything. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. And you just start getting excited now. Okay. Now, the purpose of our series, as we mentioned before, is to help us become more faithful and effective financial stewards so that we can glorify God in our personal finances, so that we can provide for the needs of our family, and lastly, so that we can give more to fund God's ministry. Amen? Amen. Last time we were together, just a quick rehash so we can get a running start. We talked about stewardship, and there we found that stewardship is really not about money. It's about drawing closer to Jesus. And we found, you know, that God puts us in, in miniature parallel positions to his own so that we gain an insight into what it feels like to be in his shoes. He is the, the, the ruler of the entire universe, and so he made man a miniature ruler over earth. As God rules, so man should rule. In the process of the two going parallel, man begins to understand what God feels like and goes through. And we found that, you know, it, it, as we do that, as we have shared experiences with God, a bond of love develops. When you go uh, with someone through an experience, it tends to bond you. And as that bond of love grows, we must understand that if we really love God, then we have to manage our finances according to His way and not ours. But that's a struggle. Amen? Amen. I didn't hear any amens there. That's a struggle. Because it doesn't come naturally to us and there's resistance within us. Now the, the understanding here is that we have a sinful nature. Although money was intended to bind us to God, there's a sinful nature vying for, for control within that is constantly trying to mislead us and use money to pull us away from Jesus instead of bringing us closer to Jesus. And so when it comes to stewardship, it, it's just the same with all the other areas of our life. There is need for truth, understanding of truth as presented in God's Word. There is the need for surrender to that truth and conviction of the Spirit. And then there is that need to step forward in faith, which is always scary. And then as we step out in faith, God begins to change our thinking and our financial habits. Amen? Amen. So now we begin our topic for this morning. Tithes and offerings, returning God's holy portion. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me. We're going to look at three texts, one right after the other. So we're going to do a lot of flipping of pages in the Bible today. So we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter what? 27. Leviticus chapter 27. And then we're going to look at verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Leviticus is the second book of the Bible. When you're there, say amen. amen. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is whose? Holy. It is what? Holy. Holy. Holy to the Lord. Turn with me now to Genesis. Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter what? 28. Genesis chapter 28. And we're going to look at verse 22. Genesis chapter 28. 
verse 22. And this stone which I have set as a pillar should be God's house, and all that you give, I will surely give what? What? A tenth to you. Let's go now to Psalms. Psalms chapter 96. Psalms chapter 96. Verse 8. Psalm 96. Verse 8. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring what? An offering. An offering. And come into his courts. Shall we pause again for another word of prayer? Our dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, as we now study this all-important topic, and as we now delve into your word, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you speak to us, that you pull back the currents of mystery, that you give us understanding, that you will communicate to us truth, not just to go through one ear and out the other, but truth that will connect us to you and enrich our relationship with you. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Did you get the gist of those texts? The, te the first two talked about tithe. The last verse talked about offering. According to Genesis, what percent is a tithe? Ten percent. Ten percent. What these verses are telling us is that God wants us to give ten plus percent of our income to Him. Ten plus, the plus is there because of the offering. God wants us to give 10 plus percent of our income to Him. And my big question, you know what my big question is? You know what my big question is? It's always the same. Why? <laughs> God wants us to give 10 plus percent of our income. Why? Well, let's surmise. It's interesting because in Psalms, it says, God, God speaking now, he says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are whose? Mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine, and all its fullness. How much does God own? Everything. So, why does God want us to give him money when he already owns everything? Why does God want us to give him money when he already owns everything? Is it maybe... Is it maybe because God wants to collect a tax or rent from us for occupying space on his planet? No. For breathing his air and using his water? Is that why God wants us to give him money? No. Is the reason why God wants us to give test plan per, test 10 plus percent is maybe is it because God is so greedy that he constantly wants a cut of our earnings? Is it perhaps maybe God is just incapable of, of running his church without our money? No. Is that why? No. Huh. Since God can supply all the church's needs himself, why doesn't he just let us keep all our income? <laughs> he doesn't need it. So why not let me keep it? You know, giving tithes and offerings just makes life harder because now we have less money to pay the bills. 
Do I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Oh my God, just all so why <laughs> does God want 10 plus percent of our income? God just ain't fair. God, I thought you were into giving, not taking. So what's the deal, God? Huh. Well, I want to submit to you this morning something that I will prove. That tithes and offerings, God's command to give tithes and offerings, is not for God's benefit, but for ours. It's meant to protect us, Amen. not to restrict us. Amen. Well, how can that be, Pastor? He's taking my money. I'm losing money. Okay, so how can it be for my benefit? Hang on. I want us to go all the way back to the beginning. And I want us to understand how this all developed. First, when God created man, there was this love relationship. You remember that in the Garden of Eden? That man was just newly created, and, and, and God formed the body of the man out of the dust of the earth, and then he breathed into him the breath of life. And when Adam opened his eyes, he saw his creator. There was a love relationship there. And, and we remember the story of how God took the rib out of Adam, and then he fashioned a beautiful woman. For Adam. And the first thing Eve saw when she opened her eyes was her creator. Together, Adam and Eve formed the human race. And there was this love relationship. It was a two-way street where God cared and provided for man. And man showed his respect and allegiance to God. Isn't that a good relationship? Now, what's interesting is this relationship was symbolized in the Garden of Eden. What symbolized this relationship? It's really weird. This relationship was symbolized, of all things, by fruit trees. It's really fruity. The relationship was symbolized by fruit trees. And if you recall in the book of Genesis, God's care and provision for man was symbolized by the tree of life and God giving all the other seed-bearing trees to Adam and Eve for food. That was how God's care and provision for man was symbolized. Now, man had to reciprocate. He had to show his allegiance and respect. And how would he do that? He would do it through respecting another tree. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You remember God's command? He told, he told Eve, um, you know, don't, don't eat of that tree. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, what? You will surely die. Question. Was God's requirement, the command he gave you, was it for God's benefit or was it for Eve's benefit? Was it meant to manipulate Eve or was it meant to protect her relationship with God? It was meant to protect. We're going to make a connection soon. But my friends, you know how it ended. She decided to disobey and remove the protection. And Eve fell to the temptation. And as a result, sin came into this world. And we find that the, this disobedience, okay, you have a relationship. God providing for man symbolized by, by the tree of life and the seed bearing trees. You have man's response or allegiance or respect for God by respecting his command regarding the tree of good and evil. You are not to eat of it, you are not to touch it. By following that command, man is loyal to his creator. But when man sinned, what was his sin composed of? It was composed of eating fruit that wasn't his. 
It was concern, it, his sin was eating fruit that was reserved by God. Essentially, he, he stole something. Adam and Eve stole fruit that wasn't theirs. And in doing so, they broke the relationship. The action, the command, is related to the relationship. You break the command and the protection, you end up breaking the relationship. Are you with me? Yes. Follow me through. After that time, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. And there, now outside of the garden, what do we find symbolizes these principles? What symbolizes God's care for man, man's allegiance, and man's disobedience? And this is where it gets interesting because we know what happened. God told Adam, Cursed is the ground, in toil you shall eat of it. Both thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread or food. In the sweat of your face you will eat bread. I want us to understand the financial translation here. When we talk about bread and food, we are also talking about our, we have the term our bread and butter. Never hear that? What God was referring to is Adam's livelihood, his source of financial income. Adam, Adam, you will, the, 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 the nature will no longer produce for you as before. Now you will have to, you, you will have to work, you will sweat, and through it you will earn a livelihood, and through it you will earn your financial bread, your income. Don't we do that every day? Don't you go to work every day? Now, I want you to see how this is. The, the, the seed-bearing trees and God's provision outside of Eden is now symbolized by the fruit of our labor, which we now understand as our financial income. But as there was a tree that was off limits, so there is income that is off limits. What symbolizes this right here? Leviticus chapter 27, 30, what we just read. A what? A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to who? The Lord. The Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Who did the tree of the knowledge of good and evil belong to? God. Yeah, we might think it's Satan, no, but Satan was an intruder coiling himself around the tree. But that tree belonged to God. And so what you find, okay, Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So tithe and first fruits of your increase are how you show loyalty to God. And so what we find now is God's provision is by providing us with a means of earning our livelihood. Man's respect and allegiance to God is symbolized by his tithes and his offerings. Are you with me? Amen. Now, what symbolizes man's disobedience? Ah, open your Bibles with me. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So it's right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Were you there? Say amen. amen. Will a man rob God? The answer emphatically is, of course not. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So in other words, man's disobedience and disloyalty in the Garden of Eden was symbolized by eating fruit that was not his and belonged to God. Outside the Garden of Eden, 
the, God's provision is symbolized by our means of livelihood. Our allegiance to him is symbolized by the giving of tithe and offering. And our disobedience is symbolized by using funds reserved by God that are his and not ours. And that's exactly what the tithes and offerings are. If you notice, disloyalty here, the crime here was stealing, and Malachi calls the crime here what? Robbery. It's all the same thing. Are you with me? Do you realize the gravity of this? This is huge. This is huge. Okay, now, just as with the trees, so it is with our finances. If we do not obey God's command and requirements, the, the commandments and the requirements are related to the relationship. You break the relation, or you break the commandments, you break the, the protection, you're actually breaking what? The relationship. This is huge. This is huge. Now, that is the reason why I'm saying tithes and offerings are not for God's benefit, but it's for ours. It's meant to protect our relationship with God, not restrict us and make life harder. It's actually for our own good. Amen? Amen. I want us to read. What happens when man begins to become successful when he doesn't give tithes and offerings. What, what happens to him? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to read it's a good chunk of passages here. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 to 18. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by keeping His commands, His judgments, and His statutes, which I command you today. Okay, that includes the, the tithing and the offering. 12, verse 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, you what? Forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty land where there was no water who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, that he might what? Test you, approve to you, to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, his relationship, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Remember the Lord. Where else do we hear that? Remember. Remember the Sabbath day. As tithes and offerings are to our income, so the Sabbath is to the time of the week. The Sabbath is the tithe in time. Tithe and offerings is the tithe in money. Are you with me? They both stand for the same thing. Remember God. Because the human nature, its tendency is what? To forget God. Tithes and offerings are a protection against our sinful amnesia. Amen? Amen. Yes. Tithes and offerings, giving it, is not meant for God's benefit, 
It's not for his good, it's actually for our good. It's meant to protect us, not to restrict us and make life harder. Are you with me? Yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Yes. Are you happy? Yes. Don't be sad. <laughs> Many of you look sad. Don't be sad. <laughs> okay. Shame on us. Now, <clears throat> Adam and Eve, as we know, were expelled from the garden. And they lost access to a special tree. The tree of life. And we understand, as we read in the book of Revelation, that our access is going to be restored to that tree when we get to the new earth. But the restoration to this, or the restoration of the access to this tree would only come through an offering, God's offering. If you notice, after Adam and Eve sinned, God provided Adam and Eve with coats of what? Skin. Where did that skin come from? Animals. Did God kind of just peel it off his arm and give it to him? Where did the skin come from? Animals. Animals. God performed the first animal offering. Why? Sure. What was God supposed to do to Adam and Eve right when they sinned? Kill them. Kill them. He was supposed to kill them. Because he said, if you eat of this, you will surely die. God was supposed to kill them right on the spot. God approached Adam and Eve, and then he turned. He got an animal, and he killed them. He said, Adam and Eve, that was supposed to be you. But Adam and Eve, that's really going to be me. What we find is the sacrifice the tradition of animal sacrifice now started with God, passed on to Adam. Then in the chapters of Genesis, we see the sons of Adam giving the sacrifice. Cain and who? Abel. Abel. This eventually um, morphed into the sanctuary service, the temper tabernacle. In the courtyard is the altar of sacrifice. In other words, this all points to redemption. It all points to Jesus as the ultimate offering. Now, I want you to notice the difference between, it didn't say this is the tithe. God, what tithe is required. It is part of the deal, the protection in our relationship. Did Jesus, was Jesus required to give his life to save you and me? Did anybody force him to do it? No. He willingly gave himself. The Father willingly gave his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Our salvation came about as a free will offering. It's Jesus freely giving his life. And so now, how do you and I show gratitude? How do you and I acknowledge Jesus? Well, we acknowledge him in the various aspects of our life. But when it comes to our finances, how do we acknowledge the sacrifice, the offering of Jesus? It's by giving our offering. You see, Psalms 96, verse 8, we read that. Give to the Lord what? The glory, the glory do his name. In other words, Jesus willingly sacrificed and, and, and the and sinful man does not understand the true extent of his sacrifice. Man cannot fully fathom what Jesus went through. Man cannot fully understand what it's like to be the God of the universe who created all things, to become this puny human being, to be spit at, to be beaten, to die for the sins that were not his. Give him the glory, do his name, because that glory is not being given, at least not yet. How are you going to do it? The next line. Bring an offering and come into his courts. But more than that, it's not just 
okay, Jesus, wow, thank you. It's, it's, I'm going to bring my offering, but that offering is not just going to be money. It's going to represent me. It's going to, reset, it's going to represent the giving of me to my Savior. Romans chapter, one, or, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of His salvation, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So when I'm giving my offering, it's not just money. It's me. I'm giving God me. Amen. Are you with me? More than that, now that I've been saved by Jesus and I'm continually giving myself to Jesus, I become a co-laborer with Jesus in the work of salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a what? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are priests. Now, of course, we're not the kind, you know, we don't wear these white collars. We don't, we don't claim to forgive people's sins. But we are priests in what sense? What's a priest? In simplest terms. He is an intercessor. You and I, are now intercessors with our high priest. And he's working the heavenly sanctuary there as our high priest. We're working the, east, the earth here as his junior priest. As he ministers there, bringing, our, uh, bringing forgiveness to us and helping us connect with the Father, so we as the junior priest connect with the lost world to bring salvation to them and link them to the Father. Amen. You Amen. are a priest. Amen? Amen. The offering, my friend, is, is my financial symbol of giving God, offering me, because He offered Himself to me. I now offer myself to Him, and more than that, I take on my duty as high priest, as, or as junior priest, to work hand in hand with the high priest. Amen. What do tithes and offerings really symbolize, my friends? It symbolizes the fact that, my clicker is not working. <laughs> that was so anticlimactic. <laughs> okay. Um, can someone... Let's see. Oh boy, I was on a roll. <laughs> okay, so, tithes and offerings. Okay, it's playing, okay. Tithes and offerings is our honoring of Jesus' sacrifice. It's offering ourselves to God, and it's acknowledging our role as priests in the work of salvation. Amen. When you give offering, it isn't just money. It's not about money. God could care less about your money. What He wants is your heart. Amen. When you give, you're giving yourself. When you give, you're acknowledging Jesus' gift. When you give, you are acknowledging your role in the plan of salvation. Amen. Amen. This is not light stuff. This is not light stuff. Amen? Amen. In the next few minutes, I'm just going to go to some practical, commonly asked questions. But does everybody get the spiritual gravity of this? Yes. Does everyone understand? Amen. Yes. Okay, so now... Let's shift gears a little and go to the practical side of things. Now that we know what tithes and offerings mean, we have some questions. I, I hope you remember my friends, John and Lisa Kahulani. Okay? They exist only in my mind, but they're here. Okay? A wonderful couple. And they have a wonderful family. I want you to meet Jake, uh, the eldest son. I want you to meet Rina, she's a senior in high school. And then I want you to uh, meet Alex. He's the baby of the family. He's 12 years old. Well, 11 going on 12. Okay, and then you have grandma and you got grandpa. They're sitting where you are and they're listening to all of this. 
And they've got some questions. You want to hear the questions? Okay. At least someone's to ask. The way things are right now, Pastor, we can barely make ends meet. Won't God understand if we don't give tithe and offering right now? Won't he understand? I mean, he knows, he knows what I'm going through. He knows I can't pay my rent or my bills. So I, I can't afford to give tithes and offerings right now. And I believe God loves me, and love is all you need, and he gets that. So I'm good. Thank you for the nice sermon. I'm good. Huh. Open your Bibles with me. Again. To Malachi. To our dear sister Lisa. Let the Bible reply. Malachi. Chapter 3. Verse 10. Sister Lisa, I, I don't want to reply to you in the negative. You know, we have enough negativity in this world. I want to apply to you in the positive. Listen to what Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Amen. God's answer to my sister Lisa is, try me. Take me up on it. And you wait and see. My personal experience with this was, I was really Lisa. I gave her a fake name and fake identity. I was really her. I handled a lot of money over my lifetime. And the tithes and offerings were hard. But I can tell you, this promise, it's real. I'm not a billionaire. I'm not a millionaire. I actually have no money in my pocket. <laughs> but let me tell you, the blessings of God are incredible. Amen. Are you struggling right now with this issue? Is it laying heavy in your heart? Take God up on his promise. See what he does. My friends, you are going to love it. Amen. His blessings may not be monetary, but I tell you, when you have, when you are right with God, there is no better blessing than that. Amen. <laughs> you can have the world, but give me Jesus. Amen. 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 But God wants his people to be the head, not the tail. Amen. So not only is it enough to take God on his promise, You've got to move forward in faith. And part of moving forward in faith is to realize your role in the process. Not only must you passively agree and accept and believe in God's promise, but my friends, you've got to get your financial house in order. The idea is you know what the priority is now. The priority is God first. And now you've got the whole rest of your finances to worry about. Well, the problem is we're going to keep complaining to God about our finances until we get the rest of our house in order. Agreed. You've got to reorganize and rearrange your financial life to reflect your new priority. Yes. Your new priority is God. And now in light of that, look at all the other aspects of your finances. Start changing. Get smart when it comes to finances. That is the reason why we're having this series in the first place. That is the reason why we're going to have weekday sessions. In the weekday sessions, we're going to tackle the nuts and bolts of personal finance because we need to know this stuff. God is not going to do for us what we can do for ourselves. Amen. God says, I gave you a brain. 
I gave you good things to study. Study it and fix your finances. Amen? Amen. Amen. Get your financial house in order. As you move out and you do what you need to do, God pairs with you and he does for you what you cannot do for yourself. And as the two of you walk hand in hand, he begins to make progress in your life. And he begins to bring the fruit of the spirit and kingdom fruit in your life. Not only in, in, in the different aspects of your life, but in your financial life as well. Somebody say amen. amen. And that is why I invite you to Tuesday's session. I wish somebody would have told me about the road ahead when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I wish somebody who had been through it all would have told me, you need to know this, you need to have this insurance, you need to have this savings, you have to have this investment, you have to do this, you have to do that, because time is passing, and time is passing fast. You are 18 now, but before you know it, you're going to be 38, and then you're going to be 48, and then you're going to be 58, and then you're going to be 68, and then you're going to look back at life and say, where did it all go? Right? Amen. Time flies. So you have to be smart. And you got to look about the road ahead. Find out what you need to know in the stages of life. What time are we meeting? 7 p.m. 7 o'clock? And what day is it? Tuesday. How many are going to be there? Me. OK. <laughs> Next. I wanted to tell you about more sessions to come. I'm getting so excited about this stuff. Since I'm going to be away for much of uh, February, we're going to pick up the sessions in March. I want you to take a picture of this screen. Mark on your calendars March 3, March 6, March 17, March 20. If you're, if you're going to miss some of these sessions, I'm doing this simultaneously at y and So um, as soon as I can get a flyer together, you'll see the dates for both churches. But we're going to cover how to create your personal balance sheet. Many people call this calculating your net worth. I don't like using the term net worth because it, when your net worth is low, it makes you feel like you're worth nothing. And that has a psychological impact that is not good. So I don't use that term. We're going to create a personal balance sheet. Um, we're going to do household budgeting. Everyone's going to bring their laptops, their, their uh, what do you call it? Um, tablets. tablets, whatever you type numbers on. Load Excel, if you have Microsoft, if you have Apple, download numbers, whatever you got that calculates. And we're going to work out your budget right here. Bring all your papers, whatever. whatever. Each of you will take a pew so that you can't see each other's finances. <laughs> and then as we go through the budget sheet together, you'll be plugging in your real numbers in real time. Make sure you check all the balances on your retirement accounts, your bank accounts. Check all the numbers before you come so that you have the accurate information to plug it in. For those who are still old school, we'll give you a paper. <laughs> yes, sister. I just wanted to encourage you in, in taking the stand that you are to present this because as the spirit moves, this is about eternity. It's not about temporal issues. Amen. And I would like to just testify in agreement to what you've been sharing. And I just want to say one short story, if I may, in the spirit. I am a person that's an everyday lay person. But I learned these things when I was 18 years old as God showed me personally what he wanted me to do after I accepted the message and, of course, after my relationship with Christ was secure, coming out of religiosity. I can just testify that never having a full-time job in my life, God gave myself in that inheritance five homes debt-free. Five, just doing what you've shared through scripture. Still to this day, never having a debt, not working in the physical world for probably the last 12, 13 years, I'm 62, but also showing that in all aspects of our lives, as we place God first, he that is faithful in the little things, is faithful in life. Amen. We obey 
Thank you for that uh, <clears throat> testimony and affirmation, sister. So we're going to cover a bunch of topics, getting out of debt, savings and investment, marriage and finances. Who, when I brought this up before our church board, wow, everybody started talking. I anticipate a very, very interesting discussion. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna tackle all of it. Now, I got, our time is really passing quickly, so I gotta get moving. The next person who has a question is actually Rena. Okay, Rina, Rina's, you know, senior in high school, she's about uh, 17, 18 now, and she says, I understand that tithe is 10%, but how much should I get for offering? Good question, Rina. Well, I'll just give you a quick guideline. The Bible doesn't specify how much to give for offering, but it should be an expression of your gratitude and be proportional to your means. I, I, I like the quote from my favorite Bible commentator, uh, Mrs. Ellen G. White. She says in Patriarchs 527, the principle laid down by Christ is that our offerings to God should be in proportion to the light and privileges enjoyed. Freely you have received, freely give. As our blessings and privileges are increased, should not our gratitude find expression in more abundant gifts? Amen. Amen. So as you are blessed, you increase it. Amen? I saw this cartoon and it really struck me. It was during those days that, uh, yeah, I had issues with this subject. And it, it, it was funny when I first saw it, but then, wow, it's deep. It's deep. Hey, Dad, why does the waiter get 20% but God only gets 10? <laughs> I saw that and, yeah. Why is that? My friends, if there's a human waiter who brings us food and we give them 20%, why should we be satisfied with just giving 10% to the Lord? My friends, I, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning. I call it the 20% challenge. Now, I know we're all in different walks of life, and we're going to make this journey together as we uh, rearrange our finances. But I would like to challenge our church family, 10% tithe, and work your way up to a 10% offering. If a waiter gets 20%, how much more should we give God? 20% pastor? 20%? 20%? Are you serious? $100,000, 20% is $20,000. Whoa, hold on. That's a lot. Well, I, I want you to understand how Israel gave. Because we're, we're not even up to where they gave yet. The contributions required of the Hebrews for religious and charity purposes amounted to fully what? One fourth. One fourth. 25% of their income. So heavy a tax upon the resources of the people might be expected to reduce them to poverty. But on the contrary, what does on the contrary mean? But instead, the faithful observance of these regulations was one of the conditions that brought them what? Prosperity. Prosperity. There's no better business partner than God. Amen. 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 Oh, my friends. Another question. Should we give tithe based on our income before taxes are removed or after taxes are removed? Before taxes. Another guideline. It's, it's your decision, but it's best to tithe on the income before taxes are removed because you benefit from the government's use of your taxes. In other words, we're tithing on the benefit. The roads that we drive on are paid for by your taxes. The, the, the fact that we can be safe in this building and not have enemy bombers over our... 
and now have missiles <laughs> coming at us are all due to strong national defense, which are paid for by your tax dollars. Um, your trash gets picked up. Your, you got three bins, right, different colors. Those are all services that are paid for by your taxes. So you actually derive a benefit from the taxes. So you, you should, in, I mean, it's best to include that in your tithable income. Okay, but again, this is between you and God. You pray about it. You ask him what he wants you to do. Lastly, time is passing real quick. Grandma and Grandpa, they finally chime in. They're hearing everybody talk, and they come out of their little corner, and they say, but Pastor, we're retired, and we're living on Social Security. Should we still give tithe and offering? What do you think? How many say yes? How many say no? That was almost ahead. <laughs> the answer is, it depends. Why? I'll just share some of my own slides. Okay. Tithe, you, have, you should tithe on an increase. But you don't have to tithe again on return of money that you already tithed on before. In other words, if the money that you gave into Social Security, you paid tithe on before it went in, then when you get it back out, you don't need to pay tithe on it because you already did. What you need to pay tithe on is the profit, the growth of the principal. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, tax refunds, cash back. Okay, basically I pay for most of this stuff after I pay my tithe. So when I get these stuff back, cash back from my credit card and stuff, I don't need to tithe on it because I already did. Are you with me? Okay, so what I'd like to share is, well, oh yeah, tithes should be given at the time that the benefit is realized. So in other words, as many of us are working people with retirement accounts, if you have a 401k or some retirement thing, uh, money is being given to you by your employer uh, if you put in enough, they match it, and you're putting some in, and you can't touch that until you're, I think, beyond 59 and a half or something like that. Okay. Or 65 or something. Okay. The idea is um, if you don't want to include that in your tithable income now, that's fine because it's not really in your hands yet. That just means that when you begin withdrawing it, that's when you begin paying the tithe. Are you with me? So the idea is, if tithe was not given on the front end, it should be given on the back end and adjusted as needed. This happens with a lot of investments, with a lot of other things. So, there you have it. I'm sure you have many more questions. Amen? Amen. And I know that. So, I want you to join us for a few minutes this afternoon before we start our second session. Our, our, our third session, rather. Our third session is how the church uses tithes and offerings. When you gave money in the offering bowl today, what do we do with it? Where does it go? How does it finance the gospel? This afternoon, we're going to look at all of that. And you're going to learn more about your church. But we're going to take a few minutes before we start that to answer and entertain any other questions you have about tithes and offerings. I know it's a Big subject, a lot of questions. We want to be able to address those. Amen? Amen. So we're going to meet here at what time? It's already 12.30 now. We can be a little, we can do Hawaiian time, you know, <laughs> depending on how the meeting goes. Okay, here's my point. When it comes to God, life, and money, stewardship requires truth, surrender, faith, changing in our thinking and our habits. It's a struggle. We all know that. But here's the truth. God says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Why? Because when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. In the end, my friends, stewardship is not about money. It's about drawing me closer to Jesus. Shall we pray? 
Our dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we thank you for, for showing us truth in your word. And now, Lord, as we are confronted with this truth, we need the aid of your spirit. Convict us. Show us, Lord, how to move forward holding your hand in faith. Lord, may we take you at your promises. May we test you. May we try you and see how good you are. For you are a good and loving God. You gave us Jesus Christ and you gave us eternal life. We are going to be indebted or we are going to be grateful singing your praises for all eternity around the sea of grass. Lord, I look forward to the day when you're going to come down in those clouds of glory. You're going to take us to our heavenly home. And you're going to say those precious words that I long to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. Now I will give you more. Enter into the joy of your Lord. May that joy begin now. May your Holy Spirit fill us. Change us from the inside out. Turn us into the people you want us to be, and then come quickly and take us home. We pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Shall we all rise?